Hi everyone and a big big welcome to this live lesson COP28 review and Q&A. It's been a momentous couple of weeks out in the United Arab Emirates and it's fantastic to be able to go through the COP climate process with all you watching and to have a think about whether it was a success or not and to help us do all of that, we have the wonderful Gabriella Jokes from the Convex Seascape Survey. Uh, good morning, Gabby. How are you? Morning, Jamie. Um, tired, but happy. Thank you. Yes, it's been a good, busy couple of weeks. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, um, thank you for being with us. It sounds like you've had no sleep, no rest for, for two weeks. <laughs> been a really important uh, two weeks. Um and we've, we've got a few things that you're going to help us with, which I'm really, really thankful for. So first of all, we're actually going to get some... So what does this all mean? There are a lot of acronyms going on. And, and to put this uh, COP into context, um, we're then going to look at, you know, you're going to share, you've got some great video and, and share what it's like to be at one of these events. And then lastly, we're going to, just going to reflect on what's happened over the past uh, fortnight and think about sort of what this means going forward. What does this mean for, for climate action uh, and the future of our planet, really? Um, so small things uh, for a Thursday morning. <laughs> um, but it's 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 going to be great. Um, so let, let's kick off um, with that sort of definitions piece. And for classes watching, we're going to refer to two student sheets during uh, this section. We're going to look at the glossary. There is a longer glossary online that's linked um, there for you. And then also the timelines of putting what's happening um, out in the UAE into context or what has happened. Um, let you get those sorted out. And then we're just going to go through some of these amazing acronyms, uh, um, Gabby. So many. <laughs> so let's just start off with COP. Um, you know, what, 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 what is a COP? So COP um, means Conference of the Parties. Really, that's a, a UN term for a meeting, a giant meeting somewhere in the world. And and um, by giant, we're talking about, you know, a, 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 all the countries, some countries, um, a couple of hundred people. Well, there's 198 countries that are part of COP, um, which is most of them, I believe. Um, and this was the, the biggest ever. So it's the 28th one, the largest ever. Um, there were 200,000 people there in total, uh, 97 of which were in the the zone where the negotiations can go on. So 97,000 in, in that zone, not... not, not, not... Um, yeah, in, that, in, in, the, in the smaller zone. And and the COP are, are the parties to this to this treaty. This this I mean this wonderfully uh, snappy title of UNFCCC. How 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 does that connect uh, to these meetings? That's a really good point. So the UNFCCC, as we call it, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's the part of the UN that was set up to really hone in and look at climate change and the point of COPs is to agree a way that we can stay uh, that we can slow climate change and stay within a 1.5 degree warming um, so the UNFCCC is the body of the UN that convenes the COPs and does this amazing and 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 that whole process was kick-started by another acronym which we're going to get get into was was the IPCC and people may, may see reports coming out from the IPCC how 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 does then that tie into to the, what we've talked about so far important important um reports yeah so the IPCC is the intergovernmental panel on climate change um and it's a global organization across those parties of of experts um that pull the science together and make recommendations and so and and am i right in saying that the IPCC became before that science sort of almost kick-started this, this, this whole process. That's right, where the world sort of got together and went, right, how are we going to organise this? How are we going to work together to, to minimise climate change? And then, then because it's we really don't happening. have enough acronyms, <laughs> uh, we, we, we've got, we've got a, a few more. And, and, and before we get to our last two set of acronyms, 
with sort of a lot of the work that seems to be happening at the COP climate summits at the moment is driven by what was decided in Paris, the so-called Paris Agreement. Yeah, that was a, a super important one in 2015. A, a bit of a breakthrough. You hear the word breakthrough a lot at these sorts of things. And that was where um, it was agreed because of the expert panel that we wanted to globally try and keep temperature rise, climate change, global warming within 1.5 degrees rather than, than two or anything else. And and that 1.5 degree rise, that, that was... You know, I think it was a, was a report that said this is the sort of safe limit. Yeah, it's just within the safe limit. There was some discussion about whether two degrees might be all right, but there's all sorts of tipping points and things that happen, um, and the effects of two degrees are a lot larger than the effects of a one point five degree warming. And 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 that 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 increase is is measured from from sort of the beginning of industrialization. Is that right? So sort of seventeen fifty odd. Um, yes, I, well, I I don't know actually. Um, from, I know it's from the Industrial Revolution. What zero is? What year zero is? I'm not sure. Is it seven? Around around there, mid 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 eighteenth century, at the beginning of industrialization. When we started inputting um, fossil More. fuels that actually changed the climate. And and so from that, you know that that that's a breakthrough. As you said, that's a a uh, sort of a goal. Um, we've got these two other acronyms, the first of which is NDC. How, how does that fit into this overarching goal of 1.5? Well, that means nationally determined contributions, and all the contributing countries have these. And I see them as sort of policy instruments. So they are literally where countries commit to what they're going to do. So they're hugely important. Okay, and so commit to what? What, what we want to do we're going to we're really going to get hold of this we're going to take action we're going to do one two three and then we have a gst <laughs> just just because we need another acronym and that was the first one this year um so that's yeah. the global stock take so this was an inventory um looking at where the nationally determined contributions have got us to so you hear lots of talk about um the paris agreement sticking to the paris agreement which is the 1.5 remember um so where have all the the accumulative nationally determined contributions got us to and and the spoiler was <laughs> not a great result really so so we're not on track to stay within one point the global stock take has shown us we are not currently on track to stay within the 1.5 percent which if you've read any of the reports is not a massive surprise and then we then have to sort of look at our sort of ndcs again is that yeah so the great news is the stock take happened this year 2023 and then in 2025 we reset we globally reset our nationally determined contributions and we would all hope they'll be much, much more ambitious. And then we will um, start to work on those and see where they get us to in limiting warming. Wow. So it's an important time. There's <laughs> a lot, lot to get my head around um, and a lot probably for classes to get their head around. I think what what's great, we've, we've got the Q&A open. Do drop in as we go along, sort of, you know, thoughts, ideas, everything else into that. Um, what I'd love now is just you've got that second timeline sheet um, just to take a little bit of time as a class. Make sure you go through those pieces, the things that Gabby's shared with us, and then try and put an order of these different events into a timeline so that we can understand how we've got to where we are today. Um, it's a little bit of work to do, so we're, we're going to give you sort of three minutes to, to, to get into that, uh, and then we'll come back and, and, and review that with you.
Brilliant. So I hope you got a, a good sense of that, getting these events into order, because I think it's really important, um, Gavin, you probably said this too, is that this has been going on for some time and to get the context and the language around this and, and also how much urgency is, is being put into proceedings. Um, super important, but I'm just going to sort of, if we can go through, so we've got 1988 and we can get the, I think we've got an answers um, slide, which we're going to have showing um, the founding of the IPCC. So I think the first articles and the first science about um, the sort of greenhouse effect and, and climate change was sort of beginning over a hundred years ago, but it wasn't until 1988, <laughs> we got a proper science report. And then it wasn't, I mean, I know these things take time, but, you know, we then, not until the sort of 1994, I think it was, with the UNFCCC, Triple C, um, came into force. I think it was, was it in 1992, it was then, there was a big summit and it was agreed, and then 1994, and then the first COP in Berlin in, in 1995, but nothing really happened until, you know, the Kyoto, in Kyoto, the third COP, what, what was in I mean, do you do you have any sort of sense about what was important about that third COP in, in Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol? I don't know why it came about then, but this was the one where we decided to do something. So you've sort of got policies and then you've got policy in, um, instruments. And it was really where they said, right, we're, get, we're getting the wording together and now we're going to put the sort of policy instruments into place to actually get on and do something. I don't know what they were. I guess they were just getting getting it right for the first two years. And, and I mean, you know, you know, and then we get, you know, it wasn't there's another sort of ten plus years. We get this idea of of equity, this idea of a, a, a green climate fund to actually give money to pay pay for some of this, especially for for countries in the in in the global south. Um, I mean, how how important is is the money aspect? Is that fund aspect um, for for you know children, students, classes to be thinking about? So there's an awful lot of discussion, you know, the climate fund, it was the green climate fund, um, and that's needing to be make, made bigger and bigger. There's some discussion that it needs $2.4 trillion is what is needed to action um, what we need to stay within the Paris Agreement. Um, and now there is this loss and damage fund as well, which is compensating countries, often in the global south. And what we mean by that are, are less developed nations, less rich nations, um, who suffer the most from climate change that's normally been caused by other countries in other parts of the world. Um, so this idea of equity is something you hear a lot about and um, uh, uh, compensating uh, global south, small island nations um, that might suffer under sea level rise. That sort of thing is something that's really prevalent at COP. And and you... Um... You mentioned that two point four trillion dollar amount. That that's that's a, that's every year, isn't it? That's not just a sort of you know that's a, a lump sum. That's that's a sort of you know we've got to keep on going for this annually. Yes, annually, and we have nothing like that in the climate fund currently. Um, and then we get into Paris, which you 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 briefly described. But this, the, you know, between Kyoto and Paris is is is, is a sort of nearly 20, 20 years to go from we're going to do something about this to actually. Every single country is going to properly have a have a set of targets to get to. Um, it just seems like a long a long time. It does. I mean, it's a long journey. I, I wonder if COP itself and the UNFCCC was set up in response to civil action that had been going going on since the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies. You know, the people saying climate change is real, let's do something. And then, but then there was an awful long journey to go on and countries not agreeing. So what Paris was, was a breakthrough in agreement where people said, it's really happening. We trust the science, it's there. We've got all the data now. What we're gonna, we all sign up to doing something about it. We're all in this. And and there seems to be some consensus this year as we get to this global stock take that everybody's going now through, through, through this process. Um, and we'll we'll come up to this probably this is you know a segue almost to, you know to to what's it like at COP, um, but this idea of consensus between the 198 parties to to this process, do you, do you think that's what makes it so difficult? This this idea of you everybody has to agree to actually take action. 
I think that's right. I think so behind closed doors, these negotiations go on. They go on through the night. They go on for days. There's only one break during the two weeks of COP for half a day or one day. Um, and it's not to say that um, countries aren't doing things around this or that there isn't consensus. It's that actually putting it into wording um, and into policy is enormously complicated. So it's almost perhaps, you know, COP and policy lags behind what we all know and what's common sense. And and all the countries are coming from different angles, really. Um, you know, we, we didn't contribute to this. We haven't gone through a whole fossil fuels transition. You did. Why should we sign up to that? There's, there's this kind of um, debate happening all the time. So when you get consensus, it's huge, you know, it's hugely exciting and important. Gabby, thank you so much for that sort of introduction. I think we've had a really lovely sort of sense of, you know, the language, the, the process, the importance. Um, in this next section, um, I would love to sort of get, you've been at COP for the past uh, fortnight, just to get your, you sort of, I read it about, about it in the news. I think probably a lot of classes may have come across us and teachers come across us in the news. Uh, I'd love just to get your impressions of what it's like to attend what, you know, you know, 90,000 people trying to come up with a plan to, to, to tackle climate change. What are your just overall impression of that? Well, it, it's huge and it's overwhelming. So just to go back one step, it's, it's it feels like a massive privilege to be there and it's not easy to get there. So it's just something I wanted to make clear. So you have to apply as an organisation and there's two zones. There's a green zone and a blue zone. Now, most people, anyone, I think, can go to the green zone. So while it's happening in a country, um, you get school groups, you get uh, businesses, you get uh, technology showcases in the green zone. Um, and sort of uh, stage performances and songs and things happening. So people go and see that. It's a real happening in the country. Um, Blue Zone, you apply for this very complicated visa process. You don't find out until a couple of weeks before whether you're going. You then get this, um, you get this fancy pass. Um, and that allows you to go to the private area with, with 100,000 other people, this COP, um, where the negotiations happen. And and there is a bit like a cross between a conference and a festival. You do sort of 16,000 steps a day on average. Um, it's vast. And um, as I said, a lot of the negotiations happen in closed rooms where everyone will wear headsets because they're all speaking different languages. Um, but then you have all these pavilions throughout the rest of the blue and green zones and they're country pavilions, um, themed pavilions. And this year they were organised into different buildings. Um, and so, so you might have sort of food and health together or nature or um, youth all sort of grouped into um, an area or a building in this case. Um, and then within that, you, you have these pavilions. So we were part of the Ocean Pavilion, which is where lots of organisations that are interested in pushing the agenda, how the ocean can help with climate change, um, get together and stage a series of talks and panel discussions um, and film screenings and all sorts of things um, there. Because, I mean, with the Convex Seascape Survey, what, what what's the purpose you know, it's, it's a great privilege to be there, but what 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 do you hope to to influence or to to to, to bring about by by being there? Two things, really. I think one is to have a seat at the table, um, because if you're not there, you know, to say we're here, this is this feels important, um, and to make a lot of connections and networks that then um, together you're bigger than the sum of your parts. And the other thing is with those existing networks that you've already made, and this is my third COP now, uh, attending as a, as a delegate, um, you are trying to push the agenda. We're trying to say, hey, nature's really important, just as much as um, finance is important, um, energy transition is important. Nature can really help us on this journey. Brilliant. And and. I mean, you, you mentioned quite a few things, uh, you know, that the, you went to the queues, you mentioned the sort of amount of people, um, there's just your 16,000 um, steps um, a day, uh, and you also mentioned the sort of different languages. Can you give us a flavour of 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 just, you know, what, what kind of groups or, or, you know, people coming to COP really stood out for you? 
Sure. I, I always um, really, really take away. It's so truly international. And I really miss that afterwards. Um, and you meet um, all sorts of different groups. You meet ministers from all different countries. They're just there and you can talk to them um, and have a real conversation over queuing for a cup of coffee. You meet there's a lot of youth representation. There's a lot of indigenous representation. And there is always some direct protests about climate change, fossil fuels, other things like that. So just to come back to the indigenous bit, you're walking around and um, you, um, I stopped some Maasai Mara because I wanted to take their photo from Kenya. Um, the indigenous people are normally wearing their 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 um, traditional costume, huge feather headdresses. You can hear them, the shells and bells kind of ringing, um, and you can just talk to them. Um, but what what I'm always struck with is how it's not you. You can't just take a photo. They then want to to have an exchange. So we went away and we sat down for sort of 20 minutes and we had a dialogue about what what life was like for them and why I'm at COP and what we're trying to achieve and that sort of thing. And and why why are the indigenous groups what what's what's the importance of their representation at these COPs? There's been a push in recent years for underrepresented groups, and they include women, youth, and indigenous voices. Okay. Um, part of this equity, uh, you know, and quite rightly. Um, these are some of the groups that have suffered the most, need a seat at the table, or I think in the case of Indigenous um, groups, it's really been recognised. Yes, of course, they're they're the most affected by climate change quite often, but also they've been stewards of the planet. Um, their entire culture is about stewarding the planet, and I think that's that wisdom's been recognised and really uh, invited to to be there and that voice to be heard. And. Um... Then, then the women. I, I I know that you know a, a colleague sent through a, a photograph of, of all the you know the main you know sort of heads of missions at COP, heads of government missions at COP coming walking down, and they're all all men. Um, I know you certainly sent through a video of of um some female protesters, I think from India as well. Could you just talk about a little bit about that sort of gender I mean, imbalance? Um, really, uh, uh, or you know, this was this was put f forward, you know, as by by a colleague. You know, this, that 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 shot of of you know leaders being being all men is 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 that an issue, and, and how's that being dealt with? I did um, I did see that photo. I have to say, my personal um, impression was I saw a lot of um, female because they're called his, her or their excellencies. Uh, around nature, it's definitely, um, there's more women and, and oceans, more women, which is um, a lovely thing. Perhaps in sort of the, the finance and the energy worlds, perhaps they're more male and sort of country leads. That's a journey that we're on, I think, as a planet, isn't it? Um, there, there are a lot more female premiers around the world now. Um, but certainly COP has a whole woman's zone, pavilion, so they're trying to um, address that imbalance a bit. And the other thing I really noticed that I wanted to say to young people was the, this proliferation of jobs and influence in policy that were being pushed by young people, people in their sort of mid twenties, and a lot of them women around oceans anyway, which is the bit I'm most involved in, really with massive influence. So. I think if I was um, a bright young person that was interested in politics, I, I could really see an incredible career. You don't have to wait um, until you're old to, to have influence. They were doing amazing things. And and just on, on the youth side, um, what's your sense that I think suddenly having spoken to some youth environmental um, activists in the past, um, that they feel that sometimes their attendance is, is tokenistic um, they're just there for window dressing um, and to make it feel like they're being included. What Did you get any sense of how involved young people were um, at, at this COP? I think it's probably a fair assessment um, because the heads of state, the excellencies generally aren't youth. So the voices in the room have been invited in. There's a couple of seats kept so that the youth voice is represented. And of course, that's going to feel tokenistic. Um, 
it's hard to to say what to do about that until young, that you, we get younger politicians, um, younger people joining politics, being active and getting to really senior positions of power earlier. Then we're going to see see younger people there. I think I'm not sure how, pe- how what the process of decision is about who comes. I know you have to do it through an organisation. And I know a lot of youth organisations do apply, which I think is a great thing and something we want to see more of. And they definitely bring energy to the blue zone in the areas. Brilliant. And Gary, I think it's a nice transition from that of, of getting younger decision makers and younger people involved in politics. And uh, maybe that that's a, a message that we can come to um, in this next section. But just before we get to, and there's lots of questions coming through, just before we get to those, um, this final piece, just to share sort of like, if you, if you haven't um, as a class um, or as an individual, sort of got a sense of what happened over the past fortnight. Should we just review briefly sort of what the sort of top takeaways um, from COP28 were? Um, and I've got the got my notes here just to to, to go through this these. Um, so I think it's the if I'm right, the so COP28 summary would be is the first mention of fossil fuels, actually the words fossil fuels um, in the final text. Um, They've just done this, haven't they? They they yeah. worked over the time period and through the night to get this. Uh, it's been called the UAE consensus. Uh, and and so so that I mean that's great. I mean you know there's there's this, this text and um and maybe we can get this up before I come and then we'll come back to the other two three four points. Is this is um. And it's quite, you know, policy, you know, you know, language, but transition away from fossil fuels and energy systems in a just, orderly and equitable manner, accelerating action in this critical decade. So as to an, um, achieve net zero by 2050 in keeping with the science. So we've got this idea of transitioning um, away from from fossil fuels and trying to make 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 that fair. Yes. And actually, the words critical decade. I would say, are very significant. Remember, they agonise over each and every word because everybody has to agree um, or doesn't agree um, with them. But, it, I mean, it does seem crazy that we're putting transition away from fossil fuels in, in the wording, finally. Um, but let's not forget, we've been doing that for for a decade and a half. It's just it's finally being put into the policy wording and being agreed by all the parties. Okay, brilliant. There's so many questions coming through. Um, I would love it. Just we're going to we've got a couple more points to make, but please um, upvote them using the thumb thing so we can get to the ones you want answered um, first, soonest. Um, and do do check um, if there's something that's already been asked. You can you can always upvote that. Um, so we've got it reinforced the 1.5 degree target. So that's good, a good thing. It did, yeah. Uh, um, it's got. It made- uh, Sorry, they made uh, 30 billion uh, available, I think, for climate solutions. Excellent. And um, we've got uh, global renewable energy to triple um, in the next seven years by 2030. That's which is quite precise. Seven years is a, is a good... <laughs> good. Or maybe we've got six yeah. years now. We're at the end of 2023. Um, uh, but the questions are remaining on, 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 on how this will be finance and especially for developing countries the global south i mean the the money piece seems to be the the, the big the big yeah piece you know, ha- great words but what's actually going to happen is is that is that a sense that you that you, you could agree with i'd say that dominates and this amount of money the the billions is a great start that's the thing isn't it it's a start the other thing um we it's not the 1.4 trillion per year that's that's apparently needed to implement what's needed to stick to the paris agreement um the other thing um that i thought was important was the loss and damage fund was finally okay. brought into us so i think that's up to over 700 million dollars and that's for its reparations for countries that have suffered irreparable damage from climate um, problems to date and um, they uh, protesters have been calling for this for a long time 700 million is not a big figure some countries have only put in a few million each which is a very small amount in global politics but again it's it's a good start 
Gabby, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, and thank you very much for, for summarising sort of where we are and, and what needs to be done. Just before we get to the questions, um, I just want to get a sense uh, from those watching um, of sort of how people are feeling about this um, before we come on. I think we'll go to the questions pretty soon. We'll put a poll up on, on, onto the Q&A app. Um, and we'll just give you a minute to sort of like, how, how do you feel um, about uh, what's what's happened at COP28? Um, choose more than one option, go as many times as you want. And, and I'm just looking at the poll, poll results coming in now. Um, the, the the options were hopeful, bored, anxious, relaxed, and concerned. And in fact, about two thirds um, are are hopeful. Um, so that was great. So there's a lot of hope, uh, and then um, a little bit of bored. Um, so that's you know you know is this you know this is all just you know taking up too much time or or, or something. Um, and board's going up a little bit, but uh, but mainly hopeful um, with the anxious and concerned um, a little bit lower, um, but still but still there. Um, let's um, now just look at um, some questions, and there are quite a lot all of them. Um, we've got this um, one here, which is about the irreversibility of climate change. Um, and and Gabby, you, you mentioned the question is how long will it take until climate change is irreversible? And I think that's it's it's almost not a time question because you know we don't know what, what is going to happen in the future. The future is unwritten. But you mentioned this idea of like this 1.5, two degrees, and um, perhaps three degrees, four degrees. And is that really looking at some of this irreversibility, these these tipping points? Exactly that. Yeah, I think tipping points is a really um, good concept for understanding it. You know, if we go beyond tipping points, then there is an irreversible impact. So rather than trying to look at the whole thing, is it irreversible? Climate has always changed. What we're trying to do now is limit human induced climate change um, by limiting fossil fuels and doing these other things. So we want to the, the 1.5 degrees is to protect vulnerable ecosystems, things like coral rainforests um it's for it's the it's what we need to stay within for food and water security if we go above that there'll be more areas of the earth that we can't inhabit and then you get all sorts of climate refugees and the problems of that so there will be changes moving to 1.5 degrees you know different things growing in different parts of the world um melting ice caps a bit of sea level change it's just that we as a species should still be able to live and thrive um, in some way. And some of these changes, of course, are positive. The move to renewals um, will give us a whole surplus of energy without doing any damage, for example. We can do all sorts of things with that energy. And, and I suppose looking at a tipping point, some things that people, you know, the melting of of, of ice caps, you know, might be triggered and that, that becomes an ongoing system, even if we take action if you reach a certain point, these tipping points, and then there's nothing you can really do do, do about that within sort of human time frames rather than that, geologic. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and so, yeah, the melting ice caps, but methane being released from that was a big thing at this COP. Um, and again, we can't really do anything. I don't think we can reverse that. What we can do is really limit the amount of methane that we put into the atmosphere ourselves. And there was a bit of a breakthrough. I think um, 70 countries signed up to a treaty about limiting um, methane emissions, particularly through agricultural practices and things. So it's it's about what can we do, I think. 
And and this question coming in um, from Furnace Academy, um, and and we won't um, probably probably won't be able to answer this because um, we're not involved in it. But the question is, how hard was it to start set up the organisation in the first COP? It, I mean, just referencing the amount of time it takes to get that agreement um, going, and and. Do you have a sense? Um, I don't know whether you have any colleagues who work in, in, in or friends who work in the sort of policy piece of, of, of how much effort it takes to to to, to make these things work. To, to to set up the whole things, I imagine a lot. I don't know anyone that was involved in the setting up of the UNF Triple C or. But, but, just, just but now, I, can give, I, mean, I know, can give an example that we know scientifically all the data was in and we knew that mangroves, coastal ecosystems like mangroves and salt marsh were um, were really helping as a nature-based solution for limiting climate change. It took 15 years from the data being in to them actually being talked about and starting to be put into treaties, agreements and nationally determined contributions for the first time. So, and that, that's something that nobody disagreed on. Wow, so it just it just takes time, it's a lag. <laughs> and you know you've been involved in in some of that sort of you know marine marine nature part of this. Why 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 does it take so? Why can't we act faster? It's such a good question. I, I yeah, twenty fifteen the the Paris Agreement COP COP twenty one. Um, the ocean wasn't even mentioned in wording in any of the agreements. And now there's sort of huge ocean breakthroughs and whole um, agreements all about the ocean and climate mitigation. So, yeah, I think when it does start, it, it goes quite quickly and it gathers momentum massively. Why it takes so long? I think that's the nature of policy um, and agreement and disagreement um, and to people uh, just not believing you, you need a lot of the science comes in and you need a lot, an awful lot of science to create a consensus. And I think that's the lag. Um, Gabby, there's a little bit here on um, there's some quite a lot on, on flooding um, and sea level rise and the connection to you know, will everything eventually um, flood. And I certainly know from from time spent in the polar regions that what we're looking at the, with the sort of Antarctic and Greenland ice caps. I think if the Antarctic ice cap fully melts, um, that's about 17 meters of sea level rise. Um, and if the Greenland um, ice cap sort of fully melts, that's about seven seven meters of of sea level rise. So yes, flooding flooding will 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 you know would occur up to some seven, 77 meters if if all the ice were to go. But that. But not the same in every place because of the, um, the way the seabed uh, is and things. So it, it's different in different places, which is why you get all these models saying what London would look like, for example, or the Maldives. Or, um, but certainly, you know, we're looking at sort of like one or two meter sea level rise. I mean, that's a sort of you know, would huge catastrophic. But but uh, you mentioned that the small island states were were a big voice at at COP. Um, you know, are, are, are we already seeing countries potentially disappearing? Certainly, that's what some of the models have been showing for a long time, um, or largely disappearing. Um, that is a peril of living on a very low land coral atoll. Um, I mean, it's certainly seems to be going a lot slower. I don't think they are... Um, seeing any difference in their day-to-day -day living at the moment, sort of 10 years after these models were created. But, you know, it is all down to how much melts, how much of these ice caps melts. And um, I think we are going to see some change and, and they're going to get smaller. There may be some migration. Um, in our in our countries in the north, we um, the climate, climate change seems to sort of make extreme weather events of which we get storm surges and that's when the sea on high tides and with big storms comes in and washes out areas and again it's not the same in every area it's to do with the lie of the land and and the sea and things um so yeah that's something that we that we put and they're becoming more frequent of course and that, that frequency of of, of of extreme weather events i think what, what i'm seeing here coming coming through on the questions is is really about sort of action and, and these questions are taking sort of um three three times of strands it's like can we do this and, and and how long will it take is is the first one um you know how long 
will it take for us to reverse the effects or stop climate change? It, do we have a date for this? <laughs> No, I mean, 2030 is a key moment and 2050, we have to have made significant impacts. So um, there's three things that we that are being looked at as solutions. One is limiting, reducing, stopping the use of fossil fuels that stops putting um, gases into the atmosphere that are making it warmer really fast. Um, that's something we can all call on our governments to do. The second thing is maximizing nature-based solutions and allowing nature, the breathing space, to do what she does and help the planetary regulatory systems. Um, that's the bit I work on. And then the third thing is the sort of man-made taking stuff out of the atmosphere, this geoengineering, which is the bit that everyone seems to know the least about and is a bit scared of. But I think we are going to have to do it to stay, we're going to have to implement some solutions. But my overall feeling is that we're a really clever species. We can get anything done when we put our minds to it and want to do it. So can we reverse it? Probably not. Can we limit it? I'm really hopeful we can. And can we find ways to live within a, a planet that looks slightly different um, under a degree of warming of 1.5, maybe 2 degrees? I'm hopeful that we can and still feed ourselves and still thrive. Yeah, we, we're, we're very sadly we're running out of time. I want, I want to focus on one one sort of big big thing, which is like, and I think we 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 talked about a slide on this as well, is that what 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 can young people do? And I know that a lot of the messaging on climate change has been you know ride a bicycle, go vegan, those types of things. Um, I I I feel always feel that's slightly unfair. Um, and what what kind of advice? would you give and i know I've, I've got some sort of ideas as well great I, my advice is really clear on this it's bother your governments and i know um i know it feels overwhelming being one person we all feel like i feel like that but look at greta she sat outside her um her parliament on a friday on her own and then it sparked this global movement eventually where people protested on fridays um you know, there's lots of ways to do that. You can lobby your MP, write letters. You can influence on social media, tell friends and families, attend protests if you're allowed. Um, and then um, key is vote and take an interest in this as soon as you can. It, you know, at 18 in our country, you can vote. And that is, that's, we all have enormous power and agency. I was really reminded of that at COP this year. And I think the other two that I think about is um, it's one of us is to sort of act as an advocate. I think bother a great, much better way of putting it, Gabby. Um, compassion, just be kind to yourself and be kind to others who don't necessarily agree with you because we all need to to do this. You know, be forceful. And none of us are um, perfect. So yeah, being kind to yourself is so key. We all are living while we're trying to do this. And then the last one, if we can sort of end on this, is together. Um, and how important have you found colleagues and, and groups and what advice would you give to young people in terms of getting involved in, in, in a wider movement? That was my take home message from COP. It's so hugely positive to be amongst 100, 200,000 other people all wanting and doing and putting all their time and energy into the same thing um there are amazing youth organizations um protest organizations um collective action organizations out there um even even without joining them um, by following on social media and following politics and things that that can have a huge influence gabby thank you so so much i mean there, there are more questions than 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 ever um today we've i think we've got through some of the main main points um what we perhaps look at in the over the next couple of days i know you need to sleep um uh, <laughs> is to maybe put up an article which we can send through um to schools just just looking at some of these you know grouping these questions a bit more and, and, and give, give, giving some answers thank you so so much to all the classes young people and teachers uh, who've been taking part and contributing in such an amazing way and gabby thank you so so much um for rushing back um being with us um today and sharing your insights uh experiences and sense of hope uh and with that um it's very sadly goodbye from both of us goodbye <laughs>